We've got 2024 on the mind. We've got 2024 in the distance because Big Ten teams are going to get in a stadium. They're going to get on the football field and they're going to play some football. Spring games are here, folks. From L.A. to Piscataway, all Big Ten all year long. This is Big Ten Ten. One of the most anticipated college football seasons in recent memory is getting ever closer. And the signs of that happening are here. And the signs of that are players getting on a football field and spring football games happening. They are going to go down this weekend, this Saturday, three Big 10 spring football games. And then we got another one seven days from now when the Indiana Hoosiers suit up in Bloomington for their spring game. We got a lot to talk about on this edition of the show. So we're going to be talking Ohio State spring game. We're going to be talking Penn State spring game, Purdue spring game, Indiana spring game, Minnesota. No spring game publicly broadcasted for them. They had a practice open to the media. I think it was open to the public as well, but a little bit of controversy here in Minneapolis, St. Paul, a little bit of controversy here in the Twin Cities uh, about that, but no spring game for them. Maybe we'll talk Gophers uh, a little bit down the line, but Buckeyes, Nittany Lions, Boilermakers, and Hoosiers. We're going to look at some storylines surrounding those teams, what to look for, what do we want to see, spring, the March April, May, a big word, especially with new coaching staffs, install. That's going to be a big part of these spring games. What do these installs look like for, say, Chip Kelly's offense at Ohio State? How about Andy Kotelnicki's offense at Penn State? The coaching staffs with Kirk Signetti at Indiana. Purdue has both of their coordinators coming back, but there's a fair amount of newness in West Lafayette as well. So we're going to take a look around that as well. Article came out from the Omaha World Herald on Sunday, and it had some quotes in there that were very, very interesting as it pertains to Nebraska's future status within the Big Ten. Is it concrete? Is Nebraska in the Big Ten for good, or do they got to get their ducks in a row academically and boost that up a little bit more to remain in the Big Ten? We're going to be talking about that as well. Now, the transfer portal does not open for another four days. Count them. Four days. But there is already a lot of movement. Maybe some players in the portal that are have their intentions to be in the portal that Big Ten teams should go after. Or maybe there's some players from Big Ten teams that were already intending to go in the portal. And then there's Barry Alexander that was going in the portal, and now he's not very committed to USC. We'll talk about all of the portal happenings right now within the Big Ten Conference, both incoming and outgoing. Buckle your seatbelts. I heard this about a month ago and said this was going to be utter madness, this portal period, and you keep on hearing it from some of these national pundits that are a little bit plugged into the inner workings of college football that... It's going to get crazy. This is the first transfer portal period with zero rules. All bets are off. Bloodline rules, so to speak, where there's nothing that can prohibit you from tampering or anything NIL-wise as well throughout all this. So we're going to be talking about some of those transfer situations as well. But I want to start off with a stadium solution. There were a lot of questions surrounding Northwestern and what they were going to do. Where were they going to play football games in 2024 and in 2025? Ryan Field has been reduced to rubble. The renovation, the new stadium, I should say, is underway in the construction of that old to new Ryan Field. That process has already begun. But the new Ryan Field is not scheduled to be done by 2026. So there were big-time questions surrounding Northwestern and where they're going to play in both 2024 and 2025. And now we have some some answers straight from Northwestern University. 
They are going to be playing, man, on the bl- on the banks of Lake Michigan at the Martin Athletics facility. You can see a soccer and lacrosse facility, the field hockey behind it, and a football facility right on the banks of Lake Michigan. Northwestern is partnering with In Production, a company behind the structures used for NASCAR viewing area in downtown Chicago, as well as temporary seating and structures at Hawaii as well, while their stadium is being built. But there's a lot of temporary seatings. There's a lot of structures. There's a lot of things that need to happen, as you can see, before anything happens with this. But you can see this is going to be a very unique type of atmosphere. You got to think the goal for Northwestern has to be 15,000, 20,000 people. Now, most of their home games are going to be at this facility, this temporary facility that will also house soccer and lacrosse. So that is going to happen throughout all of this as well. So here's what I'll say about this. This is probably the best of an unfortunate real estate situation. When you look at these stadiums on campus, and when you look at college campuses as a whole, whether you're a small campus, a medium campus, or a large campus, like there, there's a lot of in the Big Ten. I think what you see is not a lot of real estate. There's academic buildings. There's athletic facilities. There's on-campus housing. There's nearby off-campus housing as well. When you look at a professional stadium, right, a lot of times you knock down the current one and then where the parking lot was, that's where you're building the new stadium, And then once you tear down the old stadium, that'll just be a parking lot again. They don't have really that luxury at college stadiums. I'm more familiar with the University of Minnesota and the University of Wisconsin as well. So Wisconsin, they don't have any room to to do that where they can tear things down and, and build a new stadium. Now, they ain't tearing down Camp Randall Stadium. Minnesota recently built their stadium. They were playing in the Metrodome before, so they were able to build their on-campus stadium kind of at the same time. So that kind of worked. But it's just, it's a interesting dynamic here without all of this. So Northwestern is going to play a majority of their games at this temporary facility that's going to be, and I hope Northwestern is creative and incentivizes fans and really makes it a very unique experience for these two years as well. But I will say this, I think you're going to see some of these Ohio State games. I think Michigan comes and plays Northwestern as well. I think you're going to see some of those games at the Soldier Fields, at the Wrigley Fields as well. Northwestern has a history of playing at Wrigley Field, right? They played Iowa there last year where a bunch of Hawkeyes, a bunch of black and gold you saw in the crowd on the Peacock broadcast. And then you and then you look, they played Illinois at Wrigley Field as well. So I could very well see that. Maybe one game at Soldier Field and one game at Wrigley Field uh, per season is something that I could very well see happening uh, for the Wildcats right now. But you could see sailgating, depending on how the structure is built. You might need to have, have a lot of extra footballs, like a Major League Baseball game. A punt goes off the side of their foot and... All of a sudden, ball might go in the drink out in the lake, and hey, we just need another football. Same if Brendan Sullivan uh, throws a pass and the air mails it. It might go, might go over everybody's head when he throws it away and might go into the lake. So you might need some extra footballs on hand. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a TV engineer for Big Ten Network, and he was talking about the lake effect, just the wind. And remember a few years ago when Ohio State, played Northwestern on the road. It was the same weekend when Iowa and Purdue were playing in 30 or 40 mile an hour winds. I think they're in Indiana. And then you had um, Wisconsin in a, in a monsoon in Madison against Maryland where the Badgers were able to come out on top uh, in that game as well. But when I look and what I was getting back to is this, all that Ohio state game, it was 40 mile an hour winds maybe And this was a ball game. This was when, this was Pat Fitzgerald's last year. This was when they were a bad football team and they were hanging with Ohio State 
there in the third quarter, fourth quarter, until the Buckeyes put put a couple of scores on the board and, and pulled away eventually. But uh, that lake effect could be very interesting. I'm very curious to see if maybe these games at this temporary facility are earlier in the season or be, because once you get later in the season, it could get really cold late October into November, especially with that wind coming off the lake and that lake effect temperature. Boy, that could certainly be something uh, to, to really uh, to really think about as well. But this is I, I'm curious to also see if bigger fan bases make the trip to this type of facility. But it's certainly going to be interesting uh, to watch to see how this whole thing plays out um, in the end. So that's what's going on at Northwestern uh, with their stadium as well. So we've got spring football games. Spring football is here, and we are going to see teams take the field. Boy, 2024 season, it seems like it's so far away. But then again, it is very close as well. First spring game is probably the most notorious spring game, and that is the spring game of the Ohio State Buckeyes, the Ohio State University. This is going to be the first spring game that is broadcast on Big Fox, first nationally televised spring game as well. A lot of hoopla. Over 50,000 tickets have already been sold for this spring game. So let's get into some questions. Let's get into some things that I'm looking forward to in this spring game. Let's start first with the quarterback battle. This is something to really factor because all intents and purposes, it looks like Will Howard was going to be the guy, right? He's got a lot of experience at Kansas State. He put up some really good numbers when he was the starter there. It makes sense. And then his mobility, it makes sense that he would be able to slide right into Chip Kelly's system and fit right into what they want to do. But there have been some returns on what's happening in Columbus. And Columbus seems to have a lot of news and a lot of positive returns as it pertains to the true freshman. One of them, Julian Sayan. There are some reports out there saying, see what I did there, saying that Julian might be in a legitimate quarterback battle with Will Howard. What I want to see at this spring game in Columbus, how close is this battle? How close is this? Or is Julian going to more battle for the quarterback job of 2025? It seems like he's the leader in the clubhouse as it pertains to next season. Like I said earlier, Will Howard seems to fit with what the Buckeyes want this year. This is a national championship or bust possibly type of season in Columbus, Ohio. So you want somebody who's been there and done that at the college level, and you want somebody that fits with the personnel around them. I'm not sure if in a pressure-packed year like 2024 and the expectations surrounding the Ohio State Buckeyes, I'm not sure if that's the situation you want a true freshman, no matter how talented Julian Sayan might be, and Aaron Nolan, a true freshman as well, no matter how talented they might be, I'm not sure if that's what you want. I'm not sure if that's you, what you want that guy trotting out. I think both sides, both the school and the young quarterback, I'm not sure if you, uh, if you want that. But I will say this. I want to see how close this thing is. I want to see where they split the reps exactly from the quarterback position as well. When you talk Ohio State, you almost have to talk wide receivers. And you, you've you seen it. I've seen it. Your brother's seen it. Your sister's seen it. Your dad, your mom. Everybody's seen the clips of Jeremiah Smith just making absolute circus catches and looking like he belongs within a power to blue blood type of program like Ohio State. This guy is well developed beyond his years, right? He looks like a junior wide receiver on a team like Ohio State. And that's surprising because, yeah, he was playing high school football last year. This kid's a true freshman. You know, I want to see 
where this wide receiver room really stacks up as a whole, but is Jeremiah Smith the number two guy behind Emeka Abuka? There is a lot. I think once you get past number two, once you get past Emeka Abuka, I think there is a lot of questions that surround Ohio State with the Jeremiah Smith. Where is Carnell Tate? Where is Brandon Ennis? Where is Bryson Rogers? Where are all of these young wide receivers? We know that they have a lot of talent via their star ratings and then what some of them showed last year in some time. But where exactly do they stack up? How good are they? And how good is Jeremiah Smith? And can he be that guy Is he going to show it against some of these great defensive backs at Ohio State that he is a guy that this offense can legitimately go to in crunch time this season? I'm very interested to see what they're going to do at the wide receiver room as well. But there is a ton of talent there for the Ohio State Buckeyes. Let's move on to Happy Valley, Pennsylvania. They are going to have their spring game 2 o'clock Eastern on the Big Ten Network. So right after you're done watching Ohio State and then Purdue, which we will get to here in just a minute, you can watch Penn State at 2 o'clock Eastern on the Big Ten Network. There's going to be a theme throughout all of this. Wide receivers is going to be a talking point for a lot of these teams. Okay, it's not just I just woke up this morning and felt like I wanted to talk about wide receivers. It is a talking point for each and every single one uh, of these teams, I believe. Are Julian Fleming and Keandre Keandre Lambert-Smith, are those guys enough at wide receiver one and wide receiver two for Penn State to make a significant jump and be a lot more dynamic in the passing game? Specifically, Julian Fleming. I think you know what you got in KLS. But then you look to the other side, And you look at Julian Fleming and what might be there. I think that's the question. I think we feel that he's a very talented wide receiver. I think we feel that he can be a really good player in this offense. But we want to see it on the field. Spring game is the the platform that we're going to have right now. Is he going to be able to show out in that game? What are we going to see? And that really segues into my next thing about Penn State. Install, install, install. It is such a buzzword this time of year, especially with teams with new coordinators, which Penn State is certainly qualified for that, right? With Andy Kotelnicki coming into this offense. The hope for Penn State fans is that you're going to take what Mike Yurisich had bottled up in a box and you're going to unleash it by opening up the box with this Andy Kotelnicki dynamic offensive attack. That's the hope for the fans of the Nittany Lions. What does an Andy Kotelnicki offense look like schematically, formation-wise? What is it going to look like? That's, I think, the big thing that we're going to be able to tell pretty early in this for the Nittany Lions how they line up, who lines up, in which groupings as well at different positions like quarterback. We got a pretty good idea what that running back room is going to be like. But wide receiver, Penn State is expecting big upgrades. Big upgrades on offense. There were times last year where Drew Aller, when everything wasn't completely on schedule, you saw him struggle. First half of that game against Northwestern, you saw him struggle a little bit. You look against some of the good defenses like Michigan, like Ohio State, you saw him struggle a little bit. Is Andy Kotelnicki going to put these guys in a better situation to make this thing work? That's, I think, what we want to find out when we watch Penn State spring game. Of course, we're not going to see everything, right? That, I think, is a something to keep in mind for all of these spring games. But that's certainly something to keep in mind when you watch for Penn State. What does their offense look like? This Penn State offense has the potential to be really, really good. Running back room 
is really, really good. Offensive line, yes, they lose Olofashanu at tackle. That's a big loss. A couple other starters in there. But they've recruited really well the last couple of years of the offensive line. Quarterback looks good. Wide receivers, that's been the spot for Penn State. Where's Harrison Wallace in all of this? Where's Caden Saunders? Where is Malik McClain in these wide receiver groupings that we're going to see in the spring game Saturday at 12 Eastern um, or Saturday at 2 o'clock Eastern, excuse me, on the Big Ten Network as well? And where is Drew Aller's confidence in this scheme as well? I think a lot of people bag on Drew Aller a little bit. You look back at his numbers, they were pretty good in year one as a starter. Year two in a system and a coordinator that is supposed to open this up a little bit. And maybe you're going to see that step ahead for Drew Aller. Drew didn't look awfully outstanding in last year's spring game. We'll see if he can make an improvement this year. Towards the end of last season, you saw Bo Prabula at the backup quarterback and you saw his running ability. I'm curious to see if they put in some running packages for Bo Pabula, whether we see it in the spring game or whether we see it during the season as well. I think that could be an underutilized weapon for this Nittany Lions offense because I saw it a little bit late in some of those games late in the year last year. Drew Aller went out with an injury. I think that was the game against Maryland. You saw him kind of come in in that game against Michigan State where you saw his ability. And it kind of made you, made you tilt your neck a little bit and say, that's something that Penn State could do to keep some of these defenses off balance. So we'll see exactly where Bo Perbula fits into this system and scheme to see if he gets any special packages as well. Let's move on to West Lafayette, Indiana, and talk about those Boilermakers from Purdue. Rough first season for Ryan Walters. But the more I look at Purdue, there's a couple of teams out there in the Big Ten. When I start to look at the Purdue Boilermakers, that's one of those teams where at first, maybe when I looked at them a month ago or I looked at them two months ago, I kind of said, well, I don't know. It could be another tough year for Purdue. And it very well could be. But then when I see this depth chart and this roster kind of come into place and what they did in the winter portal, I'm like, this could be coming together a little bit in West Lafayette, Indiana. We are going to talk about wide receiver when it comes to Purdue because that room was completely and utterly decimated. But the first thing I want to talk about is the running back position. This is a very interesting one because obviously you got quarterback figured out with Hudson Cart. Running back, Devin Mockaby. The walk-on freshman a couple of years back. Nearly 1,000 yards rushing that season. Okay, the first thing Ryan Walters did when he stepped on campus is he gave Devin Mockaby a scholarship. Well-deserved. But then you saw him have some ball security issues during this last season. You saw Tyrone Tracy step up a little bit into that RB1 type of role, and you didn't see as much from Devin Maccabee. Now with Tyrone Tracy gone, Devin, in theory, steps up into the RB1 role. But they brought in a transfer at running back, the Big Ten fans will know all about, in former Illinois running back, Reggie Love. So the question remains, did you bring in Reggie Love to challenge Devin Maccabee for that RB1 role? Do you want a one-two punch in the backfield? What exactly does this look like? And when they take the field in the spring game, I want to see who's out there side by side with Hudson Card right away. Okay, how exactly are the reps split up and who do they kind of favor with the ones? Where do they slide the other with the twos or how do they alternate? That's what I'm very curious to see from the Boilermakers in this spring game as well. Wide receiver. Purdue has always had a wide receiver one. Rondale Moore, David Bell, Charlie Jones. Last year it was Deion Burks, one and done. He's off to play in the SEC in Norman, Oklahoma. Who's going to step up? Got a couple of receivers from Georgia. C.J. Smith, Dylan Morissette. Who's it going to be? Who's going to step up into the role? Is it going to be somebody that was buried on the depth chart last season? I just want to see who's out there. 
Who's taking reps? Because everybody left. Everybody's gone. So I just want to see, because Purdue always finds somebody. You got a quarterback in Hudson Card that can get the football to people. The keys for the Boilermakers is going to be, you got to find somebody out on the perimeter, multiple people out on the perimeter that can make plays. And then you got to sure up that offensive line. You cannot have Hudson Card running for his life like you did last season. Let's see what they got right away in spring here on this offensive line as well. Those are the spring games that will take place on Saturday. And then we move to Thursday night when the Indiana Hoosiers will have their spring game in primetime with new head coach Kurt Signetti. First thing that I want to talk about is the health of Curtis Rourke. Curtis Rourke transfer quarterback coming over from Ohio University. Where does he stand health-wise? He'd been banged up the last year or so. And I think that contributed to his numbers taking a significant, significant drop in 2023 as compared to what they were in 2022. Is Curtis Rourke fully healthy? If not, does he show signs that he can get there in time by the time we get to fall camp and by the time we really progress through this as well uh, for Indiana? Because if Curtis Rourke is healthy and if we watch this spring game and he shows some promise, he's a tall, big-armed quarterback. And he looks like if you combine him with the history that Kurt Signetti has in developing quarterbacks, that could be a pretty darn good combination for the Indiana Hoosiers. That could be something to really watch out for. Indiana's another one of those teams that I'm very intrigued with. A lot of people pegging them as a team that can really improve this season. Is that going to happen it remains to be seen. Another thing about Indiana's spring game. Boy, this is becoming James Madison West. JMU West. You got 22 incoming transfers. Where are all these transfers plugged in in this spring game? 10 out of the 22 are coming from James Madison where Kurt Signetti coached last season. Those 22 transfers are the most in the Big Ten so far. The next most in the Big Ten is Washington, naturally, with the coaching change. With 13, 13, that's how far ahead Indiana is. 22 in, 25 out. They have had a ton of movement in Bloomington. They had a lot of movement last year as Tom Allen was trying to get some transfers in place to try to save his job. Didn't work. They bring in James Madison's leading rusher, Kalon Black, 637 yards and a score last year. This was more a majority of a passing team, right? They really like to air it out in at James Madison and these Kurt Signetti coach teams. Leading receiver comes over in Elijah Surratt. Almost 1,200 yards and eight touchdowns for him last year in the Sun Belt. But then you look to the defensive side of the ball. You look at Aiden Fisher's over 100 tackles and six tackles for loss. They got an edge rusher coming off at Mikhail Kamara. Uh, Mikhail Kamara, I should say. 18 and a half tackles for loss. Seven and a half sacks. You want to see... Crazy defensive stats, especially at getting pressure, especially at playing on the other side of the line of scrimmage. Look at James Madison's season stats on defense last year. Their leading TFL guy, I think Kamara was third on the team in TFL with 18 and a half. I think their leader had over 20. Their sack numbers were crazy as well. So, There's a lot of really good production from these guys at James Madison, from the group of five level. Where do these guys plug in with some of the other transfers that came over from power four teams? And how do they plug in with some of the existing talent that exists at Indiana as well? A lot to look for in this spring period coming up as well. I'm very intrigued about all four of these. I'm going to be watching these intently to see exactly how they shift in one direction or another as well. That Ohio State broadcast on Fox is also going to be fun to see. 50,000 seats. 
50,000 at least are sold right now for the Ohio State Buckeyes. I want to move on to a non-football topic right now that was very intriguing to me when, when I saw it. And it pertains to the University of Nebraska. What is Nebraska's standing in the Big Ten? That's maybe not a question I thought I'd be asking in mid-April in the year 2024. But in an Omaha World Herald article on Sunday, that is a question that was presented. That was a question that was brought up. So let's dive into the issue. I first want to start with a quote from the article, and then I kind of want to expand and expound from there. Here's a quote from Ted Carter, former president Ted Carter at Nebraska. He's now at Ohio State. Bottom line, improvement in academic and research performance is imperative to our continued membership in the Big Ten, Carter wrote in that December memo to the Board of Regents at the University of Nebraska. It also says in the article that Ted Carter was looking for ways to improve Nebraska's research compared to peers like Ohio State. Obviously, Ted Carter left Nebraska to be the new president at the Ohio State University. Now, this really surrounds what has been happening recently at Nebraska. The Admiral President Ted Carter left. I believe their Chancellor, Ronnie Green, Left as well. We know all about athletic director Trav Alberts leaving. It all surrounds maybe what's happening within this Board of Regents and what's happening maybe at the higher levels of the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And the article really focuses on the changes that need to be made. It specifically talks about Nebraska's reinvention plan, which is headlined by getting back into AAU. Those are three letters that Big Ten fans know all too well. Is AAU a requirement? That has not been said the case by the Big Ten office, but maybe behind the scenes it very well may be. Nebraska is not getting kicked out of the Big Ten. It's not happening. You know why? Because nobody's getting picked, kicked out of the Big Ten. <laughs> Okay, all these thoughts and videos about contraction, I understand where it's coming from, but I don't see that as a possibility. Okay, I believe this memo from what is now a former president, it sticks out. It's a headline. Absolutely. But I think when you dive into it more, it's a motivation for Nebraska to really get their academics in a row and become a full university. Athletically, Nebraska is probably one of the very best athletic departments in the Big Ten Conference. I know their football has been lagging, and that's something that really needs to step up. No question about it. That needs to get on the next level. But when you look at what their basketball teams recently did, both men and women having maybe two of the best seasons that those respective programs have ever had. Fred Hoiberg signed a new contract. Amy Williams signed a new contract. Volleyball, Nebraska volleyball, is an absolute blue blood in that sport. They packed 90,000 into that stadium. And volleyball in the state of Nebraska is growing at an extremely rapid pace. So the athletic department, Troy Dannon, is stepping into an extremely strong athletic department if football even gets in the seven win to eight win category every single year nebraska is going to be a great place to be another reason why nebraska is really great for the big 10 right now is that fan base this is a fan base that i believe is a little bit of a tweener fan base between the big 10 and the sec bo nix talked about it in a recent interview when comparing the fan bases at Auburn to where he was. And then at Oregon, Auburn, he talked about football being like a religious experience down there. Of course, a lot more pressure was on him due to his connection. Of course, his dad played there as well. And he says, there was just so much pressure on you down there. Football 
is at a different level. College football is at a different level in the South. But he said when he was at Oregon, it was still a big deal, no doubt. But there was maybe a little bit more room to breathe, so to speak. Nebraska, football, college football in the state of Nebraska is the show. And it's those passionate fans that I think was a drawing factor for Nebraska to become a Big Ten member in the first place. I highly doubt that the Big Ten, either privately or publicly, would kick Nebraska or at least motivate them to maybe view other ventures, whether it's the Big 12 or whether it's the SEC, right? I just don't foresee that happening. This seems like a motivational tactic to kind of get things, get all of your academic ducks in a row to try to be on par with some of the other institutions in the Big Ten Conference. Because in 2022, UNL ranked 122nd nationally in federal research funding, competitive dollars that are highly sought after by university that put UNL 17th out of the 18 schools in the soon-to-be-expanded Big Ten ahead of only Oregon, Iowa the next closest. We know Nebraska and Iowa love to compete against each other. Now, Iowa, the next closest, was far above Nebraska at 55 with nearly three times as much federal funding. So that's a big part of this. I think it's a political motivation for Nebraska to get back into AAU. I doubt that there is any real threat that is posed right now to Nebraska. I think Nebraska brings a lot right now to the Big Ten Conference. So although the headline is big and although the headline scream something i'm not sure if it's got a lot of vocal depth behind that scream so that's where i kind of stand on this whole nebraska thing as well when it comes to the revenue sports i think that they're doing a i think that they're doing a pretty darn good job right now i like what's happening uh with these revenue sports at the university of nebraska so i can't complain much I can't complain much right there what's happening with the Cornhuskers. I want to finish up tonight. I want to finish up tonight with taking a look at what's in store. Because what's in store, it's about to get crazy, folks. You've been hearing that. You've been hearing that across all college football media outlets. This spring transfer portal period is going to be insane. There are going to be movements. We already saw a kid from USC today who was a true freshman, highly rated offensive lineman. True freshman. That was on campus, I assume, an early enrollee on campus, and he's already transferring. This is going to be a norm, folks. If you don't have your collective in a row, you're going to lose some guys. There's going to be a lot of movement here because this is the first portal period with no rules. Remember some of these court cases and litigation that happened December, January, February, type of time frame and now the NCAA can't enforce any of the rules as it pertains to NIL. They can't enforce any of the rules as it pertains to transfer portal. So get your thoughts, get the thoughts out of your mind that says, oh man, we can't tamper. We can't pay a player to induce him to come from school A to our school B. Now you get got, got to get that out of your head because that's what you need to do if you want to compete at the highest level. Let's dive into some of these transfer some of the transfer madness that has happened thus far. When it comes to some of these transfers, let's start first with Bear Alexander. Because when you look at guys in the portal, Bear was in the portal for a little bit, and then he wasn't in the portal. This is kind of the stuff that's going on behind the scenes where you're going to see a report of a kid entering the transfer portal. And then he's going to come out and say, no, 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 I'm here and I'm all in. Because you've got NIL agents and you've got people behind the scenes pulling the strings to try to get them a better deal 
in one way or another. Now, it does sound like Bear actually entered the transfer portal and then Lincoln Riley and the coaching staff did come in, swoop in at the last minute and convince him to stay. Now, when I heard that Bear Alexander was entering the portal, it was a head scratcher for me. And I'll tell you why. This defensive coaching staff may be one of the best new coaching staffs in the country. And the more I look around at the USC Trojans, the more I like them, especially on defense, right? There's been a lot of, there's been proof that what USC is putting together can be turned around into something this year fairly quickly. Let's start first with Danton Lynn. That UCLA defense last season went from triple digits to a top 10 nationally ranked defense overnight in one year. And a big reason why UCLA's defense was so good last year is because of their front. is because of their defensive line. is because of guys coming off of the edge like Liatu Latu. That front, their rush defense was one of the best in the country in a conference against some of the best offenses in college football as well. So the first part about why this was a head scratcher is Danton Lynn and what he was able to construct last year at UCLA, especially with the guys up front. Number two, who's their defensive line coach? Coach Hendy, right? He had been at the Los Angeles Rams the last handful of season. Aaron Henderson, who's now the head co- the, or I should say the defensive line coach at USC this year, developing guys like Aaron Donald and some of the best defensive lines in the National Football League the last few seasons. Now he's the guy that's coaching up this defensive line. Why would you want to transfer out against one of the best deep when you have one of the best defensive line coaches in college football? It just doesn't make a lot of sense. From the very start, this Bear Alexander thing didn't make a lot of sense. Maybe he did enter the portal. Maybe he didn't. I don't know what the details are. These USC people, what I'm being told is that he did enter the portal and then this coaching staff kind of came back and said, you know, here, what do we got to work out to get you to stay in Southern California? Whatever it is, he's staying put. And that is a big keep, big with a B1G. That is a big keep for this USC Trojans team. This is a big deal. Because they want to build their defense, I think, from the inside out. They got a defensive tackle transfer coming in from Texas A&M as well. That could be a tandem that could be really good on the interior for USC. So keeping Bear Alexander. When we talk about madness, this is the type of transfer madness that I'm talking about. (laughs) Right when you see uh, going and staying, going and staying, all that stuff. Let's move on to Dallin Hayden. For Ohio State. This happened a few days ago, maybe a week ago already for Dallin. He's got the ability to be a number one running back. Dallin does. And you look at where he is in this Ohio State lineup, and you look at where he is in this Ohio State system, he probably won't see the field a ton. He might a little bit in a pair and a spare being the spare in that running back room. But we know what Quinshawn Judkins brings to the table. We know what Trevion Henderson brings to the table, right? Those guys are going to get a bulk of the carries. And then you factor in Will Howard and his mobility and what he can do running the football. Dallin Hayden can be a number one running back right now. He can You look back a couple of years ago when Dallin, when Ohio State went on the road in classic trap fashion before the Michigan game, they went back and forth and back and forth with the Maryland Terrapins. And if it weren't for Dallin Hayden, Ohio State may have fell into the trap. Ohio State may have gotten caught in the mousetrap. 
He had a, what, 150, 160 some yards, couple of scores. Uh, I think in that football game, they were a little bit banged up in the running back room at that point in time. But he can be a number one back in the Big Ten. He can be a number one back in the SEC, the Big 12, the ACC. I think he can be a number one back in the right situation almost anywhere across college football. Now the question is, with him in the portal, what does Ohio State do for their spare? What does Ohio State do in the rest of the running back room? Because when you look at their roster and you look at what the Buckeyes have, James Peoples, high four-star true freshman coming in. Got to be excited about that for the future at Ohio State. That's good. Sam Williams-Dixon as well. I think he was in the three-star range as well. I could see them going after a young transfer portal running back that maybe played one year elsewhere, or maybe they redshirted elsewhere as well. I could see them going after a young portal running back to say, hey, you can be our number three this year, and then you can peak, can compete to be the RB1 next year. I could also see them getting an experienced guy. Remember what Penn State did last year? They brought in Minnesota's Trey Potts. Now, Trey Potts was from Pennsylvania, so there may have been a hometown connection to make that happen. But they brought in Trey Potts to be in this running back room and provide that depth for one year as well. So there's options for what I believe Ohio State wants to do. They would have loved to have Dallin Hayden. But he's been around this Ohio State program for a couple of years they kind of skipped and jumped over him by bringing in Ole Miss's Quinchon Judkins into the program. So you obviously don't blame Dallin Hayden for transferring at this point in time as well. Here's one that I'm excited about. This is another running back. Folks, buy some stock in Michigan State. Buy some stock in Michigan State. I really like what's happening out there right now. Now, we're talking about Damian Martinez, the great running back from Oregon State. Why, oh why, are we talking about him on a Big Ten show is because of that school that I just mentioned. Everybody this offseason seems like they're packing their bags and going from Corvallis, Oregon, over to East Lansing, Michigan. And Damian Martinez could very well be that next guy. He could very well be that guy right now. When I look at Damian Martinez and what he was able to do, he is a great combination of power and speed and that one cut ability to get to that next level of the defense and break it into the open field. Man, when I watched him on film, I'm going to be honest with you, did not catch a lot of Oregon State games last year, right? You probably could have figured that out. But when I pop on the film and I watch it, I see a lot of good things with Damian Martinez. And when you look at Jonathan Smith and Brian Lindgren and Aiden Childs already in East Lansing, Michigan, and then you look at this running back room at Michigan State, you look at Nathan Carter, you look at Jalen Berger. Let me say this about Jalen Berger. He was at Wisconsin running back in 2020. Braylon Allen came in and he transferred out pretty quick. Jalen Berger was there for Michigan State 2022 as their number one back, rushed for 683 yards and six touchdowns. Last year, banged up, but Nathan Carter took his spot, the transfer that came in from UConn. I think the ship has sailed on Jalen Berger being a number one back at a program like Michigan State or a bigger program like a Power Two, like in the Big Ten or the SEC. I think he can be a solid two something like a a spare in a pair and a spare situation as well. But I just think that ship has sailed, especially in East Lansing, Michigan with Nathan Carter there. And then the possibility of Damian Martinez coming over from Oregon state. I will say this, if Damian comes over from F O S U and you got Aiden Childs in the backfield, you've got Damian Martinez and Nate Carter, Nate Carter could transfer out. I know if you got those two in the backfield, Folks, keep your eye on the Michigan State Spartans. This is a team, maybe out of all of the teams in the Big Ten, 
that I have my eye on a team that could make a multiple win improvement and could be one of the most improved teams in the Big Ten Conference. I love what Jonathan Smith, maybe, maybe more than any other program in the Big Ten has done in year one in a coaching realm, maybe in the past two years, you could throw your fickles and your rules at Wisconsin and Nebraska into that as well. I love the defensive coordinator hire with Joe Rossi. I love that. I think and there's some pieces on defense to really build off of and build on as well. I don't think this defense is going to be bad like it was the last few years. Now, year one is always different. Year one is always interesting. But I got a lot of anticipation. I am drinking that green Kool-Aid right now that is coming out of East Lansing, Michigan. But this could be a lethal offense if you combine Aiden Childs and Damian Martinez both coming over um, from Oregon State as well. This He was a 1,000-yard rusher last season. Sparty fans have every reason to be excited here this season. Every reason to be excited. And I'm excited for them. I'm excited for everything that's going on over at Michigan State. It's going to be fun to watch these spring games here this weekend and to see how this thing really shakes out throughout the next couple of weeks. We're going to see Michigan playing on Fox uh, in a spring game as well. So that's going to be fun. That's going to be interesting uh, to take a look at as well. So that'll wrap things up here for this edition of Big Ten Ted Live. Thanks, everybody, for tuning into the show. We'll see you next week. We'll see you next time. Until then, have a good one, and we will see you in the next one.